Now I want to, um, to introduce our next uh, speaker, Professor Paul Dumont from the University of Asia and the Pacific uh, from the Philippines, where he teaches philosophy and aesthetics. He gained his PhD in medieval studies from the University of Toronto, Canada. He is the chairman of the Philippine Center of Civic Education and Democracy. Professor Dumol also is a renowned play writer. His play, The Trial of Mang Serapio, is considered by some as the first Filipino modernist play. At the University of Navarra, he has attended to some courses of Leonardo Polo, and he has translated into English the book of uh, Polo that inspires this conference, Ethics, a Modern Version of its cl Classical Themes. Um, well, sorry for the interruptors, but um, in case you need some water or coffee, there's, there's coffee in the back. Welcome, Professor Dumont. The topic for today is making sense of the claim that beauty is knowledge. Welcome. I am currently engaged in a project to gather Benedict XVI's ideas on art and beauty, analyze them, and put them together in an aesthetic theory. In the process, I have come up on a particular claim of Benedict's that is not easy to explain, although it is one I understand. I sense the explanation is to be found in Leonardo's, Leonardo Polo's work on thinking. My preliminary research into Polo is what I wish to report on in this talk. In his message to the Comunione Liberazione in Rimini in 2002, Benedict XVI, then still Cardinal Ratzinger, and let me call him by that name, cites Nicolas Cabasilas, the 14th century Greek theologian who claimed that beauty is knowledge. Cabasilas makes the claim referring to the beauty of Christ. Ratzinger appropriates Cabasilas' definition and applies it to art narrating a personal experience opposite to, this, to his point. For me, an unforgettable experience was the Bach concert that Leonard Bernstein conducted in Munich after the sudden death of Karl Richter. I was sitting next to the Lutheran Bishop Hanselman when the last note of one of the great Thomas Cantor cantatas triumphantly faded away. We looked at each other spontaneously, and right then we said, anyone who has heard this knows that the faith is true. In that music, there was a power perceptible that was so extraordinary of present reality, although coming from the impact on our hearts, that it could not have originated from nothing, but could only have come from the power of the truth present in the composer's inspiration. In this particular experience of Ratzinger's, beauty is knowledge of the truth of the faith. This is a broad claim. The cantata Ratzinger listened to was Wachet auf ruft uns die Stimme, BWV 140, also known as Sleepers Awake, whose lyrics speak of the bride and bridegroom, their desire for one another, and their eventual wedding. The bride and bridegroom are traditional figures for the church and Christ, the soul and Christ, Israel and the Messiah. But when Ratzinger says that anyone who has heard the cantata knows that the faith is true, he does not restrict himself to what the lyrics express. He refers to nothing less than Christian faith in its entirety. This knowledge, Ratzinger says, came with the impact of the music on his heart. The impact itself came from the power of the truth, those are his words, present in the composer's inspiration. Almost 10 years later, Benedict XVI related the same anecdote in a general audience. I'm not going to read that. 
In this retelling, Benedict specifies that the cantata spoke the truth about God. So, Benedict cites Andre Rublev's icon of the Blessed Trinity. This is the mysterious. Okay. There. As another artwork which one could have a similar with which one could have a similar experience. We are ready to accept the equivalence of truth and beauty at the metaphysical level, but at the level of the real, at the level of a concert performance, did Ratzinger allow his own faith to dictate the impression he received? Was he guilty of bias? In the general audience I cited earlier, Benedict cites the experience of Paul Claudel, who entered the Notre Dame de Paris an atheist and left a believer. Entranced by the beauty of the Magnificat that he heard upon entering, Benedict's point being, I suppose, that one's personal beliefs do not dictate our reaction to beauty. Did Ratzinger think the cantata to be true because it was beautiful, or was the cantata beautiful because it was true? When Benedict speaks of, quote, the beauty that irresistibly expresses the presence of God's truth, unquote, what he seems to be driving at with regard to this experience is that there was no need to argue from beauty to truth or from truth to beauty. Rather, one sends the presence of the truth of the Christian faith in the beauty of the cantata. Both truth and beauty were grasped in a single experience, not in his head, Ratzinger Benedict clarifies, but in his heart. How is that possible, we may ask. In his address to artists of 2009, Benedict says the experience of beauty occasioned by an artwork may bring a person in contact with the other, with what is beyond oneself, the mystery, the abyss of infinity. Okay. On other occasions, Benedict uses other and infinity to refer to God. But in the address to artists that I am citing, Benedict distinguishes between the encounter with the other, the beyond oneself, the mystery, infinity, and the encounter with, again, Benedict's own words, the transcendent, the ultimate mystery, God. Hmm. Benedict does not limit himself to artworks on religious themes. In his address to artists, he quotes Simone Weil, in all, quote, in all that awakens in us the pure and authentic sentiment of beauty, there truly is the presence of God. There is a kind of incarnation of God in the world of, it, of which beauty is the sign. Beauty is experimental proof that incarnation is possible. For this reason, all first-rate art is by its nature religious. Benedict quotes Hermann Hesse as well, Art means revealing God in everything that exists. I think the purpose of the two quotations is to make it clear Benedict refers to all art, not just religious art. Maybe we should follow Simone Weil's example and add all first-rate art. The encounter with the other, with what is beyond oneself, the mystery infinity, is not unknown to teachers of literature, art, and music. There certainly, certainly is such knowledge at the end of Homer in the contemplation of Leonardo da Vinci by the close of a composition by Bach. Knowledge that is of a piece with the experience of the work's beauty. It is difficult to put that knowledge into words. And the knowledge is experienced very differently from knowledge from books of philosophy, theology, or the social sciences. But what is this knowledge that seems to be knowledge of abstract realities and yet is not? which is comparable to direct knowledge of material reality, and yet is not. I have turned to Polo for answers to these questions. In an interview conducted in 2007, Polo was asked a question directly relevant to our topic. Do we have only one means of knowing the truth, or are we a complex unity and possess distinct sources of knowing the truth? I mean to say, is reason alone the one unique faculty? What of the famous remark of Pascal that the heart understands what the intellective, discursive reason does not? What does this mean? Paulo's terse answer was, it means that man has a knowledge superior to objective knowledge, and that is symbolic knowledge. With those two terms, objective knowledge and symbolic knowledge. We touch the edge of the broad and deep sea that is Polo's theory of knowledge. 
these are navigable waters, but not in the space of time allotted to us. I will have to ask you to rely on what Paul Oster's answer implies, that objective knowledge corresponds to knowledge acquired through, quote, intellective discursive reason, unquote, while symbolic knowledge corresponds to Pascal's knowledge of the heart. The knowledge that beauty is falls under symbolic knowledge. That is the inescapable conclusion from Benedict's distinction between reasoning and the heart as sources of knowledge. The interviewer, after receiving Paulo Sturr's answer, continued. Because I know many mothers who are poor, illiterate, and how obvious it is that they truly love their children, and yet they would not even be able to understand the rational and cultural explanation of what they sense and live. But they know their children. They give them a name that is singular and unique. The interviewer is contrasting knowledge from the heart with knowledge from the mind. He characterizes knowledge from the heart as instinctive, in a zeroing in on the deepest truth about children. Paulo's reply is much longer this time and even more directly relevant to our topic. They regard them as symbols. They regard them as symbols, which is the greatest thing that the human intelligence can do. One of the things we suffer from in our approach to truth is a lack of symbols a lack of thinking in symbols. This is a very miserable way of thinking. I believe there we have more than a symbol of the truth, the intellectual symbol, the highest symbol, God. Symbol does not mean to say something that resembles a truth. On the contrary, it is exact truth, the highest way of reaching the truth. For example, when one reaches the truth with the help of art, for me, the Pythagorean theorem is art. Polo regards the way the mothers see their children as symbols as the greatest thing the human intelligence can do. For Polo, symbolic knowledge is, much, is as much from human intelligence as objective knowledge. And it is, Polo tells us, a fortuitous part of the approach to truth, such that the lack of symbols, the lack of thinking in symbols, is a very miserable way of thinking. For Polo, head and heart are not two contrasting sources of knowledge. On the contrary, the heart is to be found in the head. So what does Polo mean by symbol? Polo says the symbol is not something that resembles the truth, but is the exact truth, the highest way to reach the truth. He offers an example when one reaches the truth with the help of art, adding, for me, the Pythagorean theorem is art. Please note the reference to art as guide to truth. Polo's example of art is from geometry, which may surprise us, but the particular example is actually of no consequence because Polo's statement would apply a fortiori to the fine arts. In Polo's example, the Pythagorean theorem is a symbol of the truth, the exact truth. It is not that the Pythagorean theorem equals the truth, but rather it is quote, a way to reach it, unquote, a way to understand what truth is. When Polo says that the poor, illiterate mothers regard their children as symbols, he means they reach the truth through their children, and the truth they reach is that each child is a unique person. The symbol is the temporalization of the truth, the road to approach it, which can appear in its entirety. These words of Polo in his book on Nietzsche help us understand that the paradoxical description of symbol as both goal and path at one and the same time. The symbol is a truth existing in time and space, that is, as concrete reality, leading to the truth outside of time and space. But it is able to do that only because it is the truth temporalized. The child is a person, which is why the child sensibly apprehended in time and space can lead to the truth of it being a person. For Nietzsche, Polo says, to symbolize is the same as to connote. To connote means at one and the same time to gather and to send. These are all quotations from Polo. This is what the artwork does, according to Nietzsche. It gathers mental associations and sends us to a particular meaning. Benedict, in his general audience of 2011, calls the artwork a communication, a communication on the part of the artist. Do we have here diversion, divergent views? I think they are both views of the same thing from two different vantage points. Nietzsche takes the point of view of the viewer, listener, reader of art looking at the finished object. Benedict takes the point of view of the artist looking at the object in the process of becoming. The artist's means of communication is the symbol. 
in his general audience, Benedict says that what the artist seeks to communicate is the deep meaning of visible reality that he has grasped. Polo's remarks about the poor illiterate mothers truly loving their children, that, quote, there we have more than a symbol of the truth, the intellectual symbol, the highest symbol, God. Yeah. Two things are being contraposed here, the symbol of the truth and the intellectual symbol. We understand symbol of the truth. We have been discussing that, but intellectual symbol? For Polo, there are two kinds of symbols, those of the imagination, those of the intellect. Intellectual symbols are ideas. They are ideas that arise from, quote, pursued, unquote, or, quote, continued, unquote, knowledge. These are Polo's terms, in contrast to objective knowledge, which Polo describes as, quote, stopped, unquote, or, quote, detained, unquote. They are the fruit, intellectual symbols, of insisting on understanding deeply and yet more deeply. They are called symbols because they point to realities that can be elucidated only above reason. And what that means, we will now see. In Paulo's theory of thought, there are three innate habits of the soul by which the human being can know beyond reason. They are synderesis, intellectus, wisdom. These names are familiar to Thomists. We know synderesis to be the habit of the first practical principle, do good and avoid evil. Intellectus is known by a longer name, the habit of the first principles. Both intellectus, quoting from our first speaker, and wisdom appear in the list of five intellectual virtues. Synderesis is ordinarily understood to initiate practical action. But in Polo's anthropology, aside from initiating practical action, it also initiates intellection. Polo equates it with the I, the pronoun I, in, the, in contemporary philosophy. Polo takes Thomas's real distinction seriously and places synderesis in the essence of the human being. Intellectus and wisdom in the person's being. What this means is that the knowledge we acquire through intellectus and wisdom is experienced as coming from deep within us. That is what I understand by Pascal's heart. I would not have to explain this if this lecture in were, were in my native language, Tagalog. There, Pascal's heart would be translated as kalooban, which literally means intimate depths. The knowledge that beauty is comes from the intimate depths of the person. Intellectus, Paulo says, is the habit by which we know that the acts, by which we know the acts of being existing outside the person. Wisdom, the habit by which we know the person we each are intimately. Paulo lists intellectual symbols in his books on Nietzsche and transcendental anthropology. Apparently, they are innumerable. Consciousness, physis or nature, truth, ends or being, the logical axioms, and deity. The knowledge of various things pursued more and more deeply converges on these six basic ideas. Polo says intellectual symbols are not abstractions. They are not generalizations. They are not incited. I don't know if that's the right translation for suscitado, Polo's term. They are illuminated. Polo's last description of them is Quote, verbs at the point of takeoff, unquote. When Paulo calls them verbs, it is because he does not, not want to call them nouns. Like Thomas has essay, they are dynamic realities that should not be frozen into forms. Most of us are used to think of the real distinction as a noun. Paulo asks us to think of it as a verb. Why describe them as, quote, at the point of takeoff, unquote? Because they are symbols and therefore exhibit something of the symbol's enigmatic character. Takeoff refers to the decipherment. This is a distinction that Polo makes. I would call them intuitions while they are, enig while they are enigmatic. Once deciphered, I would call them insights. I'm trying to translate it in 
English concepts. What deciphers, deciphers them? The, the ideas related to essence are deciphered by synderesis, those related to esse by intellectus. In the list, list of symbolic ideas is deity. And that should catch our attention because when Benedict speaks of artistic beauty as knowledge, he frequently means knowledge of God. A relation between the artwork as symbol on the one hand and intellectual symbols on the other suggests itself. The artwork experiences a symbol, symbol of the imagination, sends us to an intellectual symbol. This is similar to the poor illiterate mothers and their children who lead Polo to the intellectual symbol of God. Aside from the references to God, in Benedict's two relations of the Bach anecdote, there is a repeated reference to force or power, presence and truth. Power is felt to be emanating from the very presence of truth. I believe Benedict to be trying to capture the experience of the decipherment on the part of the intellectus of the symbol of deity. And the decipherment is experienced as the presence of truth, so strong as to seem a force that is sensed. The knowledge coming from intellectus is intuitive, not discursive. When it comes, it usually does so as a grace, as a gift. It is not a peak that is conquered laboriously, but this is precisely the way that beauty as knowledge reveals itself as a sudden manifestation characterized by depth. But there is more. Benedict is emphatic that the experience of beauty he had with the Bach cantata came not from the cantata's lyrics or dramatic situations, but from its music. It is easy to see how the lyrics or dramatic situations of sleepers awake might suggest God to the listener, but the music? Here, Polo may once again be of help. Aside from symbolic knowledge, Polo identifies two more kinds of knowledge that are higher than objective knowledge, intellectual experience and knowledge from connaturality. It is the second that is of interest to us now, knowledge from connaturality. This is something familiar to disciples of Aquinas who calls it the light that moral virtue provides from Aquinas. A person knows certain things because of the virtue he possesses. Polo identifies three virtues in particular that provide inklings. Uh, better for worse, my translation of notitias. Of the innate habits of the spirit, the virtues of friendship, justice, and prudence. Friendship, says Polo, is the inkling of the innate habit of wisdom. Justice of intellectus, prudence of synderesis. Question, how does this relate to music? Polo claims that each of the three innate habits is congruent with a characteristic, quote, sentiment of the spirit, unquote. Polo calls these sentiments the very inkling of the innate habits they are congruent with. The habit of wisdom is congruent with elation. Quote, an exultant and controlled rapture, unquote. Intellectus with serenity. Synderesis with gentleness. Polo calls the particular sentiment congruent with the particular innate habit, the tone of the sentiment. For Polo, one cannot discuss sentiments of the spirit without alluding to the particular tone of the sentiment. But Polo remarks that the abundance of words ruins any attempt to discuss the tone of the sentiments. So, I'll have to be brief. The metaphor is auditory. Is it too much to call it musical? The tones are the reason why knowledge by connaturality is difficult to describe. Each of these tones is, of course, translatable into particular rhythms. And there lies one explanation of how music can be a source of knowledge, even of God. The sentiments of the spirit, Polo observes, send us to extramental realities. The sentiments of synderesis, gentleness, to the good. The sentiments of intellectus, serenity, to the being of things. And the sentiments of wisdom, elation to God.
Paulo notes that the virtue of friendship is the inkling of the habit of wisdom because it incites us to pursue lo más alto, the highest, nothing less than friendship with lo superior, la sabiduría, Dios, the superior, the superior wisdom, God. Now, after that last slide, I risk being the laughing stock of all my artist friends. This one. Let me do two things. One is to serve you the pudding so you can prove it for yourselves. And then the second is to listen to a poet who might be saying the same thing that Polo does. I think we have time. Beto, how do we go to this? Thank you very much, Professor Dumont. Oh, sorry. Ah, here's one. No, I'm going to let them listen sorry to me. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. I think that's it, no? No, no, I'll play, I'll play it later. Yeah, let me just introduce it. The master of rhythms that bear the listener to the divine is, of course, Bach. And I would like to invite you to listen to parts one and four of Sleepers Awake. There you will find rhythms of serenity combined with rhythms of elation of the variety Polo describes as, quote, an exultant and controlled rapture. In part one, serenity dominates. You'll hear it. Dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. But in part four, controlled rapture does. The famous da -da 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 -da. Okay. Let us see that. This is part one. the control rapture. Okay. This particular part is Jerusalem preparing for the arrival of the, the bridegroom, Christ. This is the second one, where I think it's the Controlled rapture, which dominates, but you have the the tenor sings the the, the serene part. Nope. There. Jerusalem is preparing again for the arrival of the... Uh, then please compare parts three and six, the duets of the soul and Christ. Part three presents us with a gentle rhythm. It is the soul and Christ longing for one another.
Part six. Part six is pure, unadulterated, exultant, and controlled rapture from my point of view, when the soul is united to Christ and Christ to the soul. In one sense, these rhythms are determined by the text of the cantata. But in another, if one isolates the music from the text, what we are given is a gradual elevation of the mind from the gentleness of synderesis to the serenity of intellectus to the controlled rapture of the habit of wisdom. We often hear of music ennobling the soul. Paulo explains how, I think. Back shows, back shows how, climbing the ladder of the innate habits. Let me now put before you three quotations from T.S. Eliot, which I think are relevant to Polo's point about thinking beyond reason. The first comes in his long essay on Dante, com com commenting on modern man's prejudice against allegory. We take it for granted that our dreams spring from below. Possibly the quality of our dreams suffers in consequence. To Freud's unconscious, we should contrapose Polos. What we imagine Freud's unconscious to do to conjure what Eliot calls the low dream, we must imagine the, the innate habits to do to conjure what Eliot calls the high dream. The second quotation comes from Eliot's long essay on the metaphysical poets. Tennyson and Browning are poets and they think but they do not feel their thought as immediately as the odor of a rose. A thought to Don, to Don was an experience. It modified his sensibility. Of course, it isn't possible to feel one's thought unless one acquires some distance from it, unless one is able to view it. This is crucial to Polo's theory on symbolic knowledge. And we are not here talking of self-consciousness or reflection, but precisely of the innate habits of the soul, which allow one to observe one's thought taking place at a lower level. It is from that sustained elimination on the part of the habits that the intellectual symbols emerge. Eliot's remark that thought modified Don's sensibility, which I take to mean the way he perceived concrete things, proposes the continuity between thought and sensibility. This is a point Polo makes about symbolic knowledge, that the dogged pursuit of understanding that eventually yields intellectual symbols does not mean a greater and greater distancing from reality. Here is the third quotation from Eliot. The ordinary man's experience is chaotic, irregular, fragmentary. The latter falls in love or reads Spinoza, and these two experiences have nothing to do with each other or with the noise of the typewriter or the smell of cooking. In the mind of the poet, these experiences are always forming new holes. If I substituted Polo's name for Eliot's poet, would Polo turn in his grave? Eliot's new holes are not generalizations. They are not abstractions. They are, I would say, the transmutation of experiences into symbols, symbols of the imagination and intellectual symbols, which are the subject matter of his four quartets. Why these three quotations from Eliot? I wish to make the point that what Polo says about symbolic knowledge is not unknown to great artists, among them Dante, the metaphysical poets, and Eliot. The three quotations summarize everything we had seen earlier in Polo. Let me make a summary of what we have gone through. I began with the exposition of the claim made by Benedict XVI in various discourses that beauty is knowledge. 
The knowledge that beauty reportedly is comes not from reason, but from the heart, and is a knowledge that is not secondhand as from books or classes, but rather more like knowledge from the direct experience of the known. I have proposed that Polo's theory of knowledge, and specifically his theory of symbolic knowledge and knowledge by connaturality, may explain the sort of knowledge which Benedict says beauty is. Certainly, the, the decipherment of the artwork as symbol may be compared to the illumination of phantasms. But after the illumination of phantasms must follow the illumination of the intellectual operations and acquired habits that have accompanied the reading of the poem. Polo's theory of knowledge is not limited to memory, imagination, and reason, but includes synderesis, intellectus, and wisdom. The artwork operates on all of these levels of cognition simultaneously, and in the hands of Shakespeare or Dante, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Bach, or Mozart, one level may be deliberately contrasted with, reinforced, or developed developed by another. The development of knowledge in the enjoyment of a work of art takes place not along a line, but in the middle of a matrix. Of course, the ultimate purpose of this exercise has been to introduce you to aspects of Polo's thought. I have not, you will have noticed, quoted Polo on beauty. He has not written a book on art or aesthetics or beauty, although I've seen the manuscript of a lecture on art in electronic format, and Polo does have remarks on these topics strewn through his oeuvre. If we compare Polo's thought to the globe, then his theory of knowledge is the Pacific Ocean. And we have looked at a little corner of it, the part of greater interest to artists and art critics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dumont. Um, please raise your hands in case you have questions. Thank you, Professor Dumont. I'm Juan Andres Mercado from the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. I've been exploiting one text of Polo regarding synderesis. Mm. It's uh, in the latest parts of his uh, book on ethics. Um, updated pro proposal of classical subjects or themes or whatever. I don't know exactly the title in, in English. But uh, he has a very almost lyric uh, way of explaining synderesis as uh, some kind of engine for doing good. Do all the, th all the good you can, uh, don't stop. I think That's it's right. quite almost Augustinian in the sense That's of right. pushing you to make good yes. and uh, rules and some yes. other parts of ethics come later, are yes. necessary, but yes. the important thing is this kind of engine of energy yes. for doing good. Yes. Could you link this with your presentation, this well, kind of, of gentleness and synthesis? Tell and you the truth while listening to Professor Murillo. There are all sorts of things going through my mind that would uh, probably explain a lot of things which artists do, because there you have the, the mind-body problem not being problematic. <laughs> you can't have art without, without the two. Yeah. Um, you know, in, 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 the, in his Etika, when he mentions that about Cinderella being like an engine of good, I thought he was trying to disabuse us of the definition of Cinderella simply as knowledge of the first principles. And so trying to expand our understanding of it to show that, in fact, it's much deeper than that. So, and you know, I, I shouldn't say this in front of Professor Sayas. He should be the one to answer it, your question. <laughs> but I think it is a source of dynamism, and that was what uh, Professor Murillo was saying. It's a source of dynamism. Are there any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Professor Dumont. You're welcome. Before we leave, uh, because we have lunch and it's time for a rest, uh, I have uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, uh, for those who are on Twitter, we have a hashtag that is Polo14. And, um, and also the lunch is in the dining room s south. 
that is in the main area. Thank you.